Hello and welcome back to Master Gardening. I'm your host Bud Kwok. This is the show where we learn from the masters. We've got a plate full today. We're at the demonstration trial garden on Coleman Road and we're going to look at pruning, propagating, and even bluebird trails. So you stick around. I'll be right back. Jim, what a wonderful day in the garden. The yeah, sun's shining. Yeah, it's, it's warm enough. Beautiful. It's going to be almost 70 today. It's, it's gorgeous. And this this really doesn't look like much. This is the demonstration trial garden over here, but uh, in another month, it's going to be great. It's going to be flowers and shrubs and herbs and all that good stuff. We get our people out and we'll get this all That's taken right. care of. Uh, the Jim Petkoff. He is the master gardener and also a member, not president, but member <laughs> of the Bluebird, <laughs> Kentucky Bluebird Society. Society, right. Right. And we're going to look at the Bluebird Trail today. What what does it take to have a bluebird be a, is that its official title or something? Bluebird Trail? Uh, bluebird Trail, once you, you have a box, you can become a member of the Kentucky Bluebird Society. If you want to, you can make an application and have five boxes on your property, which you name and then I listed on the Trans Kentucky Bluebird Trail. So you have to have five or more boxes? Five or more boxes. And then you get on the website? You have on the website. All right. And this is kind of a self-promotional thing for you. So the box I like is the one that is made out of cedar. Your pine boxes uh, are fine, but they do, do not withstand the weather conditions. How long will one of these boxes last if made this, of cedar? This is this, made of cedar, isn't it? This is cedar. You can take and nick this and you'll see good wood. Good wood. So this will last forever. Because you don't want to paint the inside of the boxes because of the idea that it is poison to the birds. Uh -huh. That includes the hole they crawl through. Because they sometimes will pick. Mm -hmm. And they paint it, they'll get this poison and they'll kill. Now this is the size of this box, is that all scientific? That's how, how it has to be a certain height oh, and yes. all that stuff. Your cavity has to be about six inches. What that is for is that these bluebirds would nest in old woodpecker cavities and ah, trees. I've seen that. Now they do not distinguish between a cavity in a tree and a box. So you have no problem with that. The height, the distance, you must have the vent holes. Now the vent holes are located on either side that will take the heat away from the box when they're raising the young. Does it need to be in the sun or the shade? Does it make a difference? No, no difference. So you put it in the shade by any better? No. No? No. <laughs> okay. You have four <laughs> nick corners to take care of the drainage. So that's the primary thing. You have to have the vent holes and the drainage holes. The thickness of the wood, I believe, has a, quite an effect on it. They have some in the commercial uh, stores that are thin wood that heats up too fast, cools off too fast, and this give you a lot of problems. And they also don't have the depth of cavity. Now, when you come up to a box, um, what I, I like, that it faces northeast. You want to the least prevailing wind. So the wind is out of the south or west, you face it the opposite way. So the wind doesn't get in a hole in the rain and all right. that stuff, all that crap. Right. Yeah, that's what I told somebody the other day, but I wasn't sure exactly why that's, we did that. That's yeah. why. The uh, bluebird loves to come, and the male, and they'll sit up here. I can see that. You can see, yeah. see evidence of where somebody's sitting there. up there. <laughs> they love to sit up here and they'll chirp and sing away, trying to entice the female to come. When she he gets her here, she goes inside. She'll come out and sit up here and she'll go nay or nay. And she says, nay, <laughs> off he goes again to find another house for her. Yay or nay, huh? Yay or nay. <laughs> now, they love to sit and they love to, to um, enjoy. What you do, because in mid-March to April, you have the first uh, nesting. June and July is the second nesting. Usually two, I've had, the last two years, I've had nestings in August, which is very unusual. And nesting, what do you mean by nesting? Is that when they lay the eggs you're talking They're, about? Yes. They, make, they build the nest, and they lay the eggs. The eggs are four to six eggs, to blue. If you look at them, and they happen to be white, don't get scared. Somehow, there's a mutant that will make it white. A mutation? A mutation. Does that make the bird going to be a different color too, maybe? No. A white bird? A white bird, no. No? 
what you do is when you want to come up to a box and you want to see if there's anything in, you tap. Let the mother come out. Reach around to the side. Ah, can you get this, Tammy? Can you turn it? Yes, reach around to the side and you open it up. And this nobody one, home. Nobody home in this case. But as she's out, she has no problem. Don't touch the eggs, don't touch the birds. She'll come right back in the minute you shut the door. Ah. Okay? Take your pictures. Take your pictures, take what you want. Uh -huh. Now, the, the about 15 days, which I'm not going to give you a true, I have a thing that tells you each day what they should look like. It takes 15 days for them to hatch out? 21 days before they fledge. Fledging okay. means when they take the first out. Okay, 15 days to hatch, then uh, six more days before they fly. <laughs> the 21. All right. A lot of people have the front opening box. What happens there, you're standing in front, you tap in the box, the bird flies out in your face. Not so good. that's the reason I went ahead <laughs> and decided that the side opening, side opening. is much better because she can't come out. She'll come uh, out. If she's still in there, she might come out she might. on your face right. anyway. But that's unusual. She'll always go for the hole. How do you know it's a bluebird uh, nest in there? Uh, hopefully, maybe by walking around, we can find a nest or something. We Is have it, to look. Do any other birds like to nest in these? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> now, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> the uh, nest is probably the most compact nest. It's probably about that tall. It's got a little egg cup in the center. I think she goes in and she goes around the whole box. Picking up stuff? No, just to make that cup. Oh, okay. It is dead center. It is perfect. And that's where the eggs are laid in. Okay. The boxes uh, must be at least 75 feet to 100 feet from a building or a house. Well, they, just get, they won't go in there if it's closer? No, they go in there. But you have trouble with house sparrows. Now, a house sparrow will kill your bluebirds and build the nest right on top of them. Oh, my. Now, one way you can tell... That's nasty. Uh, <laughs> that's a nasty deal there. <laughs> a house sparrow is that they come up and they have feathers, they have twigs, they have a canopy. Ah, uh, I've seen that. Now, if it has a canopy, pull the thing out. They are not protected birds. So you're not doing anything illegal. You want them out of there. I pulled out four or five times until they finally gave up of trying to build the nest in there. Now, what, what, what is this, this post back here? Is it the any different kind of post you have? And this, what is this thing right down here? All right, I like slick. to put the thing itself uh, standing by itself. The post gives you a nice sturdy assembly. The white pipe acts like a predator guard. Who, predators? Who? What, what predators? Do you oh, get? cats you get and dogs, uh, raccoons, snakes. They'll come up this post to oh. get in there and eat the eggs. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So if they hear this noise, yeah, it scares them away. It scares them away. You're talking about a height of four and a half feet to six feet high. Five feet high, I'm sorry. One, two, one, two. Mm -hmm. That's about all. And this is four and a half. This is fine. Uh, 75 feet from trees and shrubs, but down in Tennessee, they plant them right next to trees and shrubs. Yeah. So I have no problem. The only thing I don't want to see it is on fence posts. Oh, I've by, seen lots of fence posts. Four by fours, because there is no guard to keep those Raccoons. And they will, I've heard of them just eating every one of them. The yes. whole, whole, whole area. Oh, area. Yeah. Eggs and all, everything. So that's why you need something. This is not foolproof, but I have never lost a nest. I've heard of putting grease on there. That didn't. Uh, grease is fine. Slide down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if you want to sit and watch the raccoon go up and down, <laughs> yes. Or the okay. squirrel. Now, the squirrel loves these boxes also. Squirrels and, live in there? Oh, yeah. They'll chew this up and make a bigger hole. Oh. This has to be an inch and a half hole. That's the size for the bluebird. So if you see it chewed up, that means you got a squirrel doing it. Yeah, you got a squirrel. I've opened up a box in the fall, uh, spring and the whole box is full of acorns. Oh my. So what you have to do then, you don't destroy the box. You just cut a two and a half inch piece, drill another inch and a half hole and screw it on top. Now, do you have to have that, the thickness? No, this is fine. You just want to do everything you can to encourage them because they uh, do the best you can because oh, yeah. they don't always come. I've, I've got one at home and I, it, it, I've never had anything in there but uh, other kind of birds like you were saying. Now you have a chickadee 
that's a desirable bird. The reason you can tell them is they have a moss bed. So they moss all. inside there? Moss instead. Oh, they're nice birds. Chickadee. The chickadee. So they're nice birds. And no problem. Uh, you just want to keep the house sparrows away. Because mm -hmm. my first nesting, first one I've ever had, was killed by a house sparrow. I could, oh. Well, you know, there's nothing in this baby right here. Can we go check another one? I'm interested in trying to find a... So we can try that. Let's try to find a nest if we can. Yeah. Jim, how do you get interested in bluebirds anyway? I, I do bees and other things, but uh, you're a bluebird expert. How do you... Oh, well, do you I'm not started? an expert, but I, I've had some knowledge on it. I've got involved about oh, 99, 2000. They had their first meeting, the charter meeting. And that's when I got involved. I've been increasing my knowledge, increasing my talking. These big trucks are right. That's okay and to then, Tammy. With and to uh, big trucks bring here. this in front of people because I, I think we need to help them. Because all the trees have been cut down, which took care of the, the cavity, habitat. habitat where they have the nest. Like I said before, they don't distinguish between a cavity or a box. So mm -hmm. they're going to have fun. Now we're going to look at this box. One thing I want to say is on the trail, which may and d does limit the city folks because they have to be 200 feet apart. Mm -hmm. They're very territorial. Uh, they love mealyworms. And Where do a, you get mealyworms? <laughs> <laughs> there's a farm store on Long Oak Road that has really it in stock. They use them for fishing too, I guess. That's yeah. what and also they also love mosquitoes. Ah, oh, that's good. So if you have a problem with mosquitoes, a box or two. But being 200 feet apart, the city folks are not going to be. But you city can folks. Now, what's the difference between a city folk and a <laughs> well acreage? <laughs> oh, acreage. I have okay. 14 boxes at my house. I see now. This is a purchase area master gardener trail, which can be located, and I have 14 boxes at my house, and I have that on the trail too. So, I, only, I live in town. I, I only got room for one. So uh, I'm, you get, what you now mean, I understand what you're talking you about, get, city folk. You get your neighbors. Get a whole block mm -hmm. and try to put them 200 feet apart. That's a good idea. Get a neighborhood association to do it. <laughs> yeah. And I, you can name I'm them. Glad you said that. Huh? Yeah. Now what we're going to do, and I don't like to see you in front in case hey, wait a minute she, now. She, she say, in case she started to come out. You haven't knocked on the door yet. I have to knock on the door. Okay, she must be out. Otherwise she'd be out by now. We're going to take a look and see what we have. We have an indication we have something. Yes, we do have a nest. Nest. There's your nest. You're in the sun, bud. Can I talk? To, can you touch the nest? Yes, you can touch the nest. You probably don't want to touch the eggs or the birds. They will come back, but in this case, we do have three eggs. Eggs, and they're, they're blue. Yes, they're blue. Now, we will probably have <laughs> at least great? two more being laid. I mean, she'll start out one, maybe a couple days later, she'll put another one or two, and she'll go up to five eggs. Huh. That's generally the average is five. And like I said, these are blue. Now, if you haven't seen white ones, don't get upset. Okay. There's nothing wrong. Now, gardener, gardener terminology, are these all going to germinate? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, they all become, after a period of time, uh, of, of incubating. Blue and then they, I think it's about 21 days, then they fledge. That mean fledging is when they take their first flight. They can and move itself out. Isn't now, that great? This no. this will be great. This is the first one for this box. The one past one, we've had that. We've had two of them in the back that's had eggs. Huh. And we also had one kill out here last oh. year. Was that so, now the knuckles killed it? No, I think it's probably a damn house bro. <laughs> She's going to get you for stepping on that plant after a while, I'll tell you that. Yeah, she is. Now, all you have to do is kind of push it back. Now, talking about house sparrow, what I'm talking about is a canopy. They would come up and go around over the top. They'd have a roof on it, kind of. They have a roof. Even, even this does have a roof. They have a roof. Then you just pull, pull it out. Pull that out and throw it away because it's a uh, scavenger bird or whatever you call it. Yeah, they're, they're not a desirable bird. That's yeah. a, the proper one. Yeah. You, know, you got to be politically correct. They're huh? still birds, though. Still, still yeah. wildlife. So no, I don't want to kill them or anything. We have a, discourage them. Discourage them is right. Take it and drop the box, put it down, turn it down, screw, walk away. Now, I noticed you were touching up here and stuff. They don't, uh, that doesn't scare them away no. from your sin or anything no. like that. No, that uh, I just use it. Now, in springtime, you want to 
bring up. Oh, I gotta get this straightened out. Never mind. Yeah, that's it. Get it up. Loosen it um, up. So make the noise. He plays. He's middle school has a camera mounted on one side, and you go onto your computer. The name for it is about this long. I'm not, I can't even get all of it out. The website, you mean? Yeah, the website that shows the nest building, the laying of the eggs, the baby hatching, the fledgings. So you can see all this on your own computer at home. How do you get the, the website for the Bluebirds, for the Bluebird Association? You know what that is by any that's chance? The same thing. Same thing? Kentucky well, Bluebird okay. Society. And then uh, if they wanted to know more about Bluebirds, they give you a call? They can do that. I want to have uh, a pamphlet um, in the extension office that will list okay, desirable great. trees, vines, shrubs, and flowers. For the bluebirds. Okay. Well, Jim, I appreciate it today. We, I, we really. That's one thing I've never got into much is birds, and you really spread the word today. I hope so. Oh, and this one right here. I'm. T oh, isn't that, that's the most beautiful daffodil I've ever seen. I think. But what do you do when the, after the daffodil bulbs, the blooms fade? So many kids' activities today seem to leave out the activity part. New research tells us that just getting children to walk an extra 35 minutes a day could spare them the pain of thinning bones later in life. Encourage your kids to get up, get out, and get moving. Hello. Hey, Grandma, how about another grape soda? For more advice on how kids can build strong bones, visit aaos.org, a public service message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Okay, it's it's daffodil time of the year around around these parts. Oh, and this one right here. I'm t oh, isn't that that's the most beautiful daffodil I've ever seen? I think. But what do you do when the, after the daffodil bulbs the blooms fade? Uh, and we've talked about this before, but it's this time of year again. There's a little bitty seed pod that will grow right behind the flower. So after the flower dies, the seed pod wants to propagate, and you don't want it to propagate that way. So you want to cut these seed pods off behind the uh, at the top of the stalk. The best thing to do is go all the way down to the bottom. Your, your, your plant will look a lot better if you go all the way to the bottom, but if you're, you're lazy like I am, just break off or, or, or cut off this little seed pod behind the bloom. That way all the energy will go back down into the soil, into the bulbs, and you'll get a bigger bulb and bigger flowers the next, next year, and they'll multiply quicker. Oh, once you've done that, don't mow these down. Well, you can if they're really unsightly. It depends on what you want. But if you want the daffodils to do well, you want to leave these green leaves alone. You can tie them up, make them look pretty, but that'll hurt the hurt the daffodil too. It'll it'll pinch off the, some of the uh, veins and the, the the circulation of the daffodil, and the, it'll hurt the hurt the daffodil. They'll probably live through it, and it'll probably look a little bit better. Martha Stewart likes to do that, but it's not the best thing for the daffodil. Wait till these turn brown. Once they've turned brown, you can mow them down, do whatever you want to. Once they've got brown, got gotten 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 brown. Then also you can dig them. So if they've got a clump, these these all look really well. But if you've got a clump that's really tight, and maybe they didn't have as many blooms as they had last year, they're too close together. After you've, you've cut the brown foliage off, dig them up, dry them, clean them off a little bit, store them till the fall, maybe September, sometime between September and March. Replant them again, spread them out, leave a few where they were, or you probably don't have to worry about that. There'll probably be a few you miss. <laughs> that's usually my situation, and move them. Okay, let's go do some pruning. This is also the time of the year to be pruning your flowering shrubs, uh, especially the ones you want to wait till after they've flowered to, to prune them. That's the same way with the ones in, this, in the late summer and fall, but it's best just to go ahead and wait till they go dormant and do it in the wintertime. That's what most of us do. But the forsythias, the pussy willows, the azaleas, the flowering almonds, all those, they bloom on last year's wood. That makes it complicated, but if you just remember you want to wait till they bloom in the spring, wait till the forsythia is done blooming to prune. If you prune them in the fall, you prune off all the wood that's going to have the bloom, so you won't have, you're pruning off the bloom, so wait till they bloom. This is a pussy willow bush. I've got a tree at my house that's 40 foot tall, and people can't believe it, but that's, I pruned it up as a tree. This has been pruned not very well, by the way, but it's been pruned as a bush. And these are the little pussy willow right here, and you can see that right in here, these are still 
like the pussy whittles, and then they bust open into this pollen type thing, these little yellow pollen, and the bees just love it. You can see them, they're all over. Those, these are honeybees. We've got two uh, honeybee uh, hives down here, and this is full of honeybees. It's about, I can see 20, 30, 40 of them on here. By the way, the honeybees will only put out enough bees on this to systematically work it perfectly. They won't just put a thousand bees on one bush. They all, they or, they're very organized, and I know that people don't realize they're that organized, but they are. Okay, this is at the time, well, we want to wait out another week for all these little pussy willows to, to, to go out, but now is about the time to start pruning this. Uh, right here, you can see where somebody has done some terrible, a terrible job of pruning, and what I would take, I would take a, a saw and go ahead and I saw that whole thing out of there. It's never going to be pretty. I like bushes that look good in the winter time, even when all the leaves are gone. That's why I, I never th recommend topping trees or topping bushes or anything. But somebody's come in here and done that. You can see where they've done this. They've, they've cut these limbs off here. And the only thing I can think of is they came in here and did that because they wanted it for decorations. They took them home and put them in a little vase or something. Because I would never do that. I, what, the way to prune any, almost any bush, and it's your bush, you can prune it any way you want to, but if you want to do the best for the bush, or what have you, you want to go all the way back, like right here, say I want to prune this little one off right here, I'd go all the way back to the stem right there and cut that off. That's what they should have done. Or go all the way back, like this one right here, if I want to take that off, all the way back, and get your just a very small nub at the end. That didn't cut very good right there. Let's try one in here. See these, these limbs are crossing right here? You want to cut out the crossing limbs, you want to cut out the damaged limbs, and then you, you prune for shape. You may want to go in here and, and get the in, clean the inside out so the air can get in there so it keep away from diseases. This has got all kinds of problems in here. You see this limb right here? I take a whole limb out because it's in there crossing. This one right here is rubbing. That's what happens with crossing limbs. They rub. They cause places to open up for diseases and what have you. This shrub needs lots of work, but the master gardeners are going to be here in about another month. They'll have this all cleaned up and looking good. Now at the bottom here, there's another little thing we might add while we're here, Dan. At the bottom here, you can see some of these have gone out from the base here. And right now, this one's got, is rooted, is rooted. it's called the tip layering. And it's got down into the, the soil and it's, it's formed a new tree. So you can go in here and cut this loose from the plant, dig that up with the roots, take it somewhere else and replant it and you've got a new plant. Forsythia does the same thing, but if they're not doing that, you can go ahead and take a limb, take it down, cover it with soil, maybe nick it, nick, nick, the, nick the bark a little bit, put it on the ground, cover it up with soil, put a brick on it or something, and then it'll, it'll automatically do it. Or you can wait and watch for the automatic, natural way. Okay. Well, that's got me out of breath, Dan. <laughs> propagation, propagation, propagation. This is one of my favorite parts of gardening. It's real easy. You can multiply your plants. Proven winners, that's all they do to, to, to get their plants is, is to propagate from stem and, and uh, leaf cuttings. We've got all kind of plants underneath here. The master gardeners are really in full bloom here. Uh, here's some more, they're all over the place. But we're going to take a, a scented geranium this morning. And all you've got to do, and you don't have to do the, the tip cutting, but we're going to do that today. You can, you can cut it off up here, but I'm going to cut right below the leaf node. Whoa, we just about lost one. Tammy, okay, right below a leaf, leaf node, rip those leaves off of there. There's a little bloom, get that bloom off there for sure. Okay, get the blooms off. Okay, we're gonna get some roots out of that little leaf node right there mainly. Just dip it in a little bit of water, some root tone, knock the excess root tone off. Stick it in some potting mix, not potting soil, not seed starter but potting mix. That's ready to go. All I can do is water it now. Maybe put a plastic bag over it to keep it moist. If I've got a spray uh, uh, gun I'll, I'll put a little spray on it every time I walk by it in the greenhouse. But in about a week or two that'll start getting some roots on it. And how you can tell that if it's doing well, it'll first of all it'll look good, but then when it gets some roots like this one right here, you reach down there and you pull on it if it just slides out, it doesn't have any roots, but you can see that has a, a little tug on it. It's tugging back. That means it's got roots in it. And that's all there is to it. You've got your seed starting, and now this is propagation from plants you've already got. And I'm stealing this from the master gardeners. I'm sure they don't mind. They've got thousands of them. 
And if you're out here at the demonstration trial garden and you want to take some cuttings, be careful, don't take any of the prize plants, but take some side cuttings and get you some uh, plants started and they'll be blooming. This plant was probably done probably about last November and see, it's already blooming. Now this rose right here is a, is a climbing rose and you normally don't prune climbing roses because of their, their uh, blooming habits. But you do want to prune it so it's, it's not going to catch some strangers or visitors. So I'm going to prune this one out of my way before I get serious here. And you always want to prune, hopefully at an angle where the water won't, won't coagulate. And you want to prune right above a bud. But I love that name, bud. Okay, that way this, anything above that bud would be, would die and, and be a place for disease and what have you. So you want as little as, little as possible above that bud. Okay, we're going to put that away. Now, like I said, normally you just, you prune off the dead, dead part of the, uh, sh the uh, uh, climbing rose, cross branches, anything that looks nasty or might be where you don't want it, but just let it go. You don't, I've heard of some people pruning them all the way back to the ground. You're probably not going to get any roses for another year when you do that. Starting over, I've, I've done that before, but if it's where you want it, you don't need to prune it at all. That's one thing good about climbing roses. Now look at, look at these wonderful onions right here that you can have. Oh, ah, those two came up okay. If you don't get the bulb on that, they'll be right back. Oh, I got them all. This is a good time of the year to be doing that kind of thing. Okay, now we're gonna pretend because we don't have any hybrid teas here. We'll pretend this is a hybrid tea rose. Do a little pruning with it. You do the same thing in the fall. You wanna prune them back to about two feet. Okay, just so they don't do a whole lot of wind, the wind smacking them around and that kind of thing. Move them right down to this, about two feet. Wait till spring, like right now, and then you want to prune them all the way back. This is your hybrid teas, not your climbing roses. Hybrids and the other kind. Okay, you want to prune them all the way back. That way you, you, have, you have two foot buffer that may be winter kill. If you prune them all the way back to, in the fall, then you have any winter kill, it'll go all the way down into the root and you may lose your rose. So then you want to come back in here and I'm going to pretend this is a hybrid tea. Prune it again at an angle, right above one of the little buds, little leaf bud. The best thing to do is to go around the outside and prune to an outside bud. If you don't have an outside bud, like this one right here is on the inside, you have to get, do that, do that. But you want to prune, if at all possible, to an outside bud. When I mean outside bud, like this bud right here is outside, this is inside. You want all the limbs to go, to grow outward away from the plant. The best, worst thing about roses is black spot and funguses because we live in an area where we have so much water, so many rivers. So you want to clear out the inside, get the air in there. So you want to prune to outside buds and try to prune, prune the uh, growth away. You want to get rid of these dead limbs like this one right here is dead. I don't know if that'll cut with this. There it is. Get rid of the dead wood. Oh my. Get rid of the dead, get rid of the crossing, get rid of the stuff in the center here. Cut all this center stuff out. This is dead also. A lot more dead stuff in there, but you want to clean out this center and prune back to about just about three or four inches outside buds. Okay, we'll get into the spray in, in, in another show. That's a whole show <laughs> in itself. Uh, this is Bud Quok. Uh, we've had a wonderful day in the garden. It's beautiful. The sun's shining. We'll see you next time. Until then, good gardening. It's the hardest thing that you do. Because I have to practice. Okay. Hello, welcome back to Master Gardening. I'm your host, Bud Quas. This is the gardening show. <laughs> hey!